Hi everyone and welcome to another video. Based on the recent voting, this video will be all about low rank adaptation, a method for fine tuning very large deep learning models. But not only that, we will also talk about some foundations on how to deal with large models in general. As most of you probably know, the model sizes, especially for large language models, have been scaled to crazy numbers. Meanwhile, we've already reached around 1.8 trillion parameters with GPT-4. Many people want to fine-tune their custom data sets on these large models, which is of course a challenging task, because on one hand, you need to tune a lot of parameters, which takes some time, and secondly, the GPU requirements are massive. So in this video, we will talk a bit about techniques to cope with large models, and especially talk about LoRa, a popular method for parameter efficient fine tuning. To build some foundational knowledge in order to understand the following, let's quickly take a look at some concepts regarding precision and quantization. If you feel familiar with these topics, you can skip this part and jump right to the LoRa timestamp. The weight matrices in neural networks are made up of floating point numbers. Not sure if you have ever realized this, but usually these values are stored in a float32 data type. So what does this mean? In computer science studies, you learn how a computer internally represents floating point numbers using only zeros and ones. This is done by reserving bits for the sign, exponent and fraction of this equation. Here is an example of 7.5 and some additional digits in 32 bits. Now one obvious Thing that has been done is to lower the precision using other data types. For example, we can switch to half precision, which has only half of the bits to represent a number and therefore only requires half of the memory. The downside is that we lose precision. As you can see in this example, we cannot represent as many digits as in the 32-bit case. And this loss in precision in terms of rounding errors can accumulate quickly. Given this information, it's straightforward to calculate the actual model size in terms of gigabytes. For this, you simply multiply the size of the data type, like float, with the number of weights in the model. This gives you a rough estimate on how much memory is required to run a model. For training, however, you require even more than that, because you additionally need to store each weight's gradients and learning rates. An example, Bloom is a 176 billion parameter model and it corresponds to roughly 350 gigabytes of memory. For inference, this means you need several large GPUs to run this model. The impact of using other levels of precision for model training has been evaluated intensively in the literature. Usually, using half precision still works reasonably well for training neural networks. But this of course depends on the dataset. There's also a trend to use mixed precision, which means that different parts of the network operate on different data types. Now, what about going even lower than half precision? A lot of papers have been reported that very low levels of precision don't really work out of the box. There is, however, a trend to use quantization, which allows you to go very low, even only integers, and still maintain the model performance. These methods do not simply drop half of the bits, which would lead to an information loss, but instead calculate a quantization factor that allows to maintain the levels of precision. Here's an example of a half precision matrix converted to int8 using quantization. How this exactly works is content for another video, as there exist different quantization techniques. At this point, it's just to emphasize that it's possible to reduce the size of a model by lowering the precision. There is also a very nice recent paper in which the authors ran 35,000 experiments to compare the optimal combination of model size and k-bit quantization. The conclusion is that 4-bit quantization is almost universally optimal. It's obvious that less digits mean less memory. But it's not only less memory, but smaller precision models are also faster to train on most GPUs, because it takes less time to read the data. Halving the precision typically gives two times speed improvements in terms of flops during training. FLOP stands for floating point operations per second and is a common measure to compare the speed of hardware. It's the maximum number of floating point operations, like multiplication, that the hardware might be capable of. 
Here you can see that the performance of GPUs has been increasing over time in terms of flops. This means that the hardware is capable of executing faster matrix multiplications which are needed for deep learning. Here's an example from a NVIDIA benchmark that shows that smaller precisions increase the flops. Alright, now we know two ways to make huge models smaller, namely lowering precision and applying quantization. Besides these data type improvements, there's an emerging research trend for parameter efficient fine tuning techniques, which means fine tuning large models using less weights than the total number of weights. Let's have a look at a few of these methods. The traditional way of transfer learning was to simply freeze all weights and add a task specific fine tuning hat. The downside of this, however, is that we only get access to the output embeddings of the model and can't learn on internal model representations. An extension of this are adapter layers presented in a Google research paper from 2019, which insert new modules between the layers of a large model and then fine tune on those. In general, this is a great approach, however, leads to increased latency during inference and generally the computational efficiency is lower. A very different idea specifically designed for language models is prefix tuning, presented by Stanford researchers. This is a very lightweight alternative to fine tuning, which simply optimizes the input vector for language models. Essentially, this is a way of prompting by prepending specific vectors to the input for a model. The idea is to add context to steer the language model. Of course, prefix tuning only allows to control the model to some extent. So sometimes a certain degree of parameter tuning is necessary. This finally leads us to LoRa, the probably most commonly used fine tuning approach, which we will discuss in more detail in the following minutes. It performs a rank decomposition on the updated weight matrices. Of course there exist more techniques and a great place to work with them is the hugging face library with implementations of parameter efficient fine tuning techniques called PEFT. Later in this video, I will also give you a simple example. Let's first discuss what LoRa, so low rank adaptation, actually means. The rank of a matrix tells us how many independent row or column vectors exist in the matrix. More specifically, it's the minimum number of rows or columns. Here's an example. This number is an important property in various matrix calculations from solving equations to analyzing data. Now, a low rank simply means that the rank is smaller than the number of dimensions. In this example, we have three dimensions but a rank of two. Low rank matrices have several practical applications because they provide a compact representations and reduce complexity. And finally, adaptation simply refers to the fine tuning process of models. Now, what's the motivation behind LoRa? LoRa is motivated by a paper published in 2021 by Facebook Research that discusses the intrinsic dimensionality of large models. The key point is that there exists a low dimension reparametrization that is as effective for fine tuning as the full parameter space. Basically this means certain downstream tasks don't need to tune all parameters but instead can transform a much smaller set of weights to achieve a good performance. Here's an example for fine-tuning BERT and they show that using a certain subset of parameters, namely 200, it's possible to achieve 90% of the accuracy of full fine-tuning. Using a certain threshold is how they define the intrinsic dimension, so basically the number of parameters needed to achieve a certain accuracy. Another interesting finding evaluated on different data sets is that the larger the model, the lower the intrinsic dimension. This means, in theory, that these large foundation models can be tuned on very few parameters to achieve a good performance, and that's mostly because they already learned a broad set of features and are general purpose models. Based on these results, the LoRa paper presented by Microsoft researchers proposes the idea that the change in model weights, delta W, also has a low intrinsic dimension. As we know from before, the dimension is related to the rank of a matrix, therefore LoRa suggests to fine-tune through a low-rank matrix. More formally, this is done through rank decomposition as expressed by this equation. W0 are the original model weights which stay untouched. 
B and A are both low rank matrices and their product is exactly the change in model weights delta W. An important note, it's not relevant that we find the decomposition of delta W into B and A, but rather we care about the other direction. We construct delta W by multiplying B and A. That also means they need to be initialized in such a way that delta W equals zero at the start of training. This is done by setting B to zero and the weights in A are sampled from a normal distribution. Let's have a look at an example. The shape of this weight update matrix is 4 times 4. It's constructed as the product of B times A. B and A are both low rank matrices and their rank is 2. On four dimensions the implications are not too obvious yet. But imagine the shape of W is 200 times 200 then it's much more efficient to fit two matrices of 200 times 2 instead of the full quadratic matrix. This decomposition can be applied on any dense neural network layer, but in a transformer it's typically applied on the attention weights. In the forward pass, the input is then multiplied with both the original model weights and the rank decomposition matrices. The output of that is then simply added together. Because of this, the implementation of LoRa is fairly easy. In addition to the regular forward function, which we can see on the top here, we now also send the inputs through the low rank matrices and scale the result with a scaling factor. The output of that is simply added to the output of the frozen model. The only trainable parameters are A and B, the low rank matrices. But why is this scaling factor used? Looking at the details in the paper, we can see that the output of B and A is scaled with alpha divided by the rank. The rank in the denominator corresponds to the intrinsic dimension, which means to what extent we want to decompose the matrices. Typical numbers range from 1 to 64 and express the amount of compression on the weights. Alpha is a scaling factor. It simply controls the amount of change that is added to the original model weights. Therefore, it balances the knowledge of the pre-trained model and the adaption to a new task. Both the rank and alpha are hyperparameters. I found this GIF which shows an example of scaling the ratio from 0 to 1 for an image generation model. Using 0 it will produce the output of the original model and using 1 the fully fine-tuned model. In practice, if you want to fully add LoRa, this ratio should be 1. It could also be larger than 1 if you want to put more emphasis on the fine-tuning weights. If your LoRa model tends to overfit, a lower value might help. If the fine-tuning doesn't really work, the ratio should be increased. The reason why alpha is divided by the rank is most likely that you want to decrease the amount of weight updates because with a higher rank you will have more values. But why is the scaling added in the first place? Why do we need to balance this at all? The author states that this scaling helps to stabilize other hyperparameters like learning rates when varying R. So in practice you might want to try different levels of decomposition by varying the rank and through the scaling you don't have to tweak the other parameters too much. Talking about the rank, what is the optimal rank to choose? In a LoRa paper, different experiments have been conducted that show that a very small rank already leads to pretty good performance. Increasing the rank does not necessarily improve the performance, most likely because the data has a small intrinsic rank. But this certainly depends on the data set. A good question to ask when choosing the rank is, did the foundation model already see similar data or is my data set substantially different? If it's different, a higher rank might be required. Different experiments run by the authors indicate that LoRa significantly outperforms other fine-tuning approaches on many tasks. Here it's compared with techniques like prefix tuning and different adapters. So let's quickly summarize the main benefits of LoRa. Because of the rank decomposition, we have much more convenient computational requirements during training. There are less weights to tune, the training will be faster and less memory is needed. Another beautiful thing is that we can simply merge the delta W weights from the rank decomposition 
with the original model weights by simply adding them together. We end up with a new model without any overheads during inference like in the case of adapters. Finally, a cool feature is that we can simply switch between different LoRa weights when fine-tuning for different downstream tasks. So this provides us with a sort of model zoo for a specific foundation model. Finally, let's talk about how we can implement LoRa in practice. A lot of work has been done by the Hugging Face team to enable easy usage of this technique. The repository PEFT, which stands for Parameter Efficient Fine-Tuning, provides implementations for all popular fine-tuning techniques, including LoRa. So luckily, we don't have to manually apply low-rank decompositions to every single layer. Instead, we can make use of the function getPathModel, which does this job for us. In a config, we can even specify certain target modules, for example, the key, query, and value matrices of transformers. Here you also find the mentioned hyperparameters alpha and the rank. We can then call a function that prints the total number of parameters and the trainable LoRa parameters. In this example we can see that only 0.19% of the original model weights will be trained. So overall this is a very convenient library and allows to train huge models on a single GPU. Going back to the beginning of this video where I talked about quantization, you now also have the option to combine quantization techniques with LoRa to ultimately reduce the hardware requirements. This paper called QLoRa presented earlier this year additionally adds 4-bit quantization to the pre-trained model weights. That means we don't pass the input through the original model weights but instead through a quantized version of it. Alright, that's it for this overview. I hope this was helpful to get familiar with the topic and I would be happy to see you again in a future video.